So welcome everybody. Um, it's great to have you here. I'm Julia Mortimer, the Journals and Open Access Director at Bristol University Press, and I'll be chairing the session today. So the webinar is to launch the journal, our brand new non-profit fully open access offering. And we'll be recording the webinar so that we can make it available afterwards. Closed captions are enabled, so you can turn them on if you wish to. And please put any questions in the Q&A and they'll be answered um, in the session after the speakers. And please use the chat if you have any technical issues and problems and my colleagues will help you. But firstly, I'd like to say how grateful we are to the University of Bristol for their support in the setup of this important journal and to all the internal advisory board members who have helped to get it off the ground. It's so wonderful to see the vision we had for the journal become a reality and for this first collection of papers to be even better in representing that vision than we could have possibly imagined. We launched with a brilliant and highly topical introduction, introductory collection of articles on the theme of addressing the global social challenges of our time. With an excellent line of international authors, we are very lucky to have some of them join us today from a range of countries and time zones to tell you about their papers. Um, and talking about different time zones, we're very lucky to have Bronwyn Morgan, Professor of Law at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, one of our six co-editors-in-chief, and she's joining us from a very late um, time zone in Australia right now, and she'll be introducing um, the journal. So thanks very much, Bronwyn. Well, well, warmest of greetings to all of you gathered here around what feels like a too cool, too blue hearth of the Zoom screens. And as uh, Julia says, in my case, from a wintry near midnight in Australia, and we're gathered here to help celebrate the launch of this journal. And I just want to pause on that name, Global Social Challenges. When I first received an email about this project from Julia, it was November 2020, and this potentially glib phrase which is tossed around by so many pro vice chancellors and research councils, was already at that time taught and quivering with the lived reality of the pandemic, that creature of science and geography, medicine and climate change, but so much more, and most especially stiflingly global and provocatively social. And since then, over the 18 months of the collective midwifery of this first inaugural issue, that sense of global social challenges multiplying and emerging at ever faster speeds from ever more diverse directions has continued to humble and educate us. For me, the title of the journal in the early days likely conjured intimations of ambition, vision, deliberation. And yet what I have most valued as we have birthed the journal is really rather different, care, attention, respect. And I can only speak tonight as part of different versions of various we's. I happen to be a solo introductory voice, but it's most definitively a collective and layers of collective we's who have shaped this thus far. There is the we of the editorship and our team of six co-editors in chief come from five continents and as many disciplinary backgrounds, supported by a further 17 associate editors from four continents and 16 countries. And there's a third layer of 20 more people on the editorial advisory board. So our cross time zone diary skills and our capacity to fight our natural melatonin rhythms are already remarkable. But more seriously, the convivial and mind opening conversations that we have had have been profoundly generative and have brought a combination of seriousness, moderation and reflective curiosity to the task of addressing global social challenges, which I think is crucial. Now this we is also made up of the incredibly skillful, responsive and kind support from the team at Bristol University Press, which has really modeled the collaborative infrastructure that inspires us all to continue to contribute our time and effort in the rapidly diminishing gift economy of academia, it's been a pleasure. And it's important to all of us that this professional support is embedded in the not-for-profit approach to open access. And we encourage input from the readers and contributors that we hope are listening tonight and will um, join us as the journal gathers pace as to how we can collectively best address the tensions between equity, affordability and access in that model. 
Now, the next iteration of a we is the community of those who have written in this first issues and, of course, those who will write in the future. And that conversation begins both in this launch issue and in what you will hear facets of to come in the rest of tonight's launch. But I just want to express two facets that really struck me most about the papers in our, our inaugural issue across them. And the first dimension is that I felt in comparison to much literature that grapples with global challenges, there is in these papers a greater sense of a sweep of time and space, a, 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 an expansion of the historical and geographical framing of the issues addressed that cast them in fresh light. And yet they still remain pragmatically oriented to problem analysis and critique. And those two facets of this particular aspect are often combined through conceptual reframing, whether that's of basic units of analysis for social science or novel ways of breaking the silos between different sustainable development goals. Um, but it comes together in a way that really opens up a, a fresh perspective. And the second aspect I notice is an insistence on combining that problem analysis and critique with some sense often of looking forward of illuminating positive new ways of being, thinking and doing, as we said in our aims and scope. And we, we alluded to this in our opening editorial as well as a heuristics of hope. But I think what comes in this launch issue, which is really valuable, is also a strong sense of responsibility along with that, a degree of humility that is conscious of the voices of those not on the page or in the room, and is also conscious of the risks of over-optimism or the carelessness of ambition. And these are themes which we really want to cultivate, not only in the research articles, but also the non-traditional formats we're encouraging, policy and practice, debates, provocations. And to just capture that sense of how far we might push boundaries, I want to just close with the words of one more layer of we, someone from outside, all of those layers, um, an author of a book which defies categorization of either discipline or genre called Hospicing Modernity by Vanessa Machado, de Oliveira, and she says this, which I think captures a really distinctive way of combining critique and hopeful imagination. Modernity conditions us that to believe in order to change reality or our ways of being, we first need to imagine what the change looks like and then make a plan and act to achieve that goal. But we will only be able to imagine something genuinely different if we first become suspicious of what we desire and are able to imagine within modernity. And something about that suspiciousness combined with the creativity of imagination, um, along with the other characteristics we'll see infusing this first issue. And now we are able to hear more of tidbits from the, uh, the authors themselves. So thank you and welcome, and we look forward to the future. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Bronwyn. Um, that really summed up what the journal's about. Um, so next up, we have Adriana Abdenour, who is co-founder and chief executive of Plataforma, a women-led institute based in Brazil and dedicated to issues of climate governance and peace across the global south. And Adriana is going to be um, speaking on her paper about local approaches to climate sensitive peace building lessons from Afghanistan. And she's currently in Geneva, so that shows you um, something of the international nature of this project. Thanks, Adriana. Uh, thank you very much, Julia. It's a pleasure to, to join um, this group and to be part of this wonderful project. Um, as a Global South scholar, I'm based in, in Brazil. It's wonderful to see new open access journals opening up. Um, Siddharth Tripathi, who is my co-author and I, we actually met through a project where we think about the politics of knowledge in international relations. So for us to see new channels opening up is very gratifying. Um, I also wanted to start by acknowledging, you know, yesterday there was a very serious earthquake in Afghanistan with very high levels of casualties. And of course, this represents a humanitarian emergency nested within a broader humanitarian crisis. And I very much hope that the international community will not continue to look away, but rather find ways to dialogue and to enhance um, access to, to aid in this context. Let me briefly go over our paper um, and how we started. We've been a part of these debates on security and climate. These are both research discussions, but also policy debates 
that have taken root at the United Nations and other global governance institutions. But in general, what we notice is that these discussions are very top down. They tend to happen at a very high level of aggregation or they're constrained to um, the types of responses that you see at national and subnational uh, levels. So we wanted to ratchet down the level of analysis and look on the ground in a conflict uh, setting and to ask how is this perceived and what is done at the local level? Because uh, sometimes initiatives are not called explicitly climate security initiatives or climate and peace building, but when we look at what's being done on the ground, um, that often is very relevant. And of course, methodologically in the case of Afghanistan, where uh, CIDART in particular has um, more than 10 years of experience, this uh, poses some hurdles because with the return of the Taliban to power, it's very hard to uh, get access firsthand. We are not able to do field work. Perhaps at some point we will be able to follow up on this type of uh, work. But uh, we did manage to catalog uh, and map uh, existing initiatives before the return to power of the Taliban that incorporated climate sensitive peace building to some extent. And we think this is very important because these broad discussions, for instance, of climate and security, as they're taking place in the United Nations and partner organizations, sometimes they tend to overlook local knowledge and the lived experiences demands concerns from communities. So uh, through this South-South collaboration, since uh, Siddharth is actually from India and I'm from Brazil, we were, that was our starting point. And we are also thinking about, you know, the critiques of the liberal peace approach and the sort of top down, very military um, approach that was taken not only in Afghanistan, but also in, in other countries and wanted to explore alternatives from the ground up. And so local climate sensitive um, peace building is, is our place of interest. What we know in the case of Afghanistan is that climate change is dovetailing with environmental destruction and degradation to undermine water security and therefore food security since the vast majority of the Afghan population depends heavily on agriculture uh, for subsistence and for survival. And uh, climate is already uh, shown to cause massive displacement, especially within um, Afghanistan. Of course, that, that dovetails too with conflict, but you also get cross-border uh, flows of uh, migrants. And you, 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 we see very uh, broadly in different parts of Afghanistan that local communities have turned over time to the cultivation of opium, which is a crop that helps to fuel the conflict. It's not the cause, but it, it's definitely not part of the solution. Um, and it's also a crop that is not very climate resistant. So for instance, some of the initiatives that we found uh, in Afghanistan, they seek to promote alternative crops, especially saffron, which is very resistant to drought, um, so that farmers can get higher returns by cultivation of saffron rather than opium. And at the same time, then they are working on an economy that is not directly tied to the illicit um, and the, the, the conflict dimension of the crisis in Afghanistan. We also found a number of initiatives that uh, seek to uh, boost food security because in many parts of Afghanistan, the food production is limited, including due to the climate to a specific part of the year, but the construction of greenhouses and the adoption of climate smart agricultural practices is helping some communities to boost and to strengthen and lengthen that period of cultivation, therefore improving food security. By the way, many of these initiatives um, were being led by women or incorporated a strong gender lens. And this included some initiatives that were then uh, scaled up under a government program uh, focusing on food security. Again, this was prior to the return of the Taliban uh, to power and uh, that also had some backing by external donors, uh, even though that was not the, 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 the core of the approach by these particular donors. 
Um, we also found a number of instances of South-South cooperation, for instance, by actors from India, where there was a very clear climate component, whether uh, uh, in, in uh, the design of uh, community level risk assessments or the design of responses that took climate into account. So again, South-South cooperation um, is an understudied element of peace building and peace and conflict in general, but we found some in really interesting examples. And the overall argument, of course, is that this type of initiative is not a panacea because the, the situation in Afghanistan and other conflict affected settings is so complex, but rather we see it as an approach that should be better identified and incorporated into a broader toolkit of peace building approaches that if necessary can be scaled up, although of course these responses have to be very uh, context uh, appropriate, but that may represent you know, an alternate way of entering um, the peace field in places like Afghanistan uh, without the dominant sort of heavy military uh, approach that as we know, not only has failed, but in fact has often led to even more negative outcomes. Um, so we think that it's, it's an area that merits further research. And in terms of policy, since I, I am the head of uh, a think tank, we also uh, issue some recommendations from the incorporation of climate considerations into risk assessments, as well as the design of peace building responses, drawing on local demands, concerns, and experiences and perceptions for policy making at higher levels of aggregation. But also that we see clearly a need for climate financing when that's very concerning right now with the war in Ukraine, you see a tension um, not only being driven away from Afghanistan, but from climate more broadly. Um, and finally, the need for more evidence-based research, I would say especially by Global South scholars, uh, whether from Afghanistan in this instance or other developing countries, because again, to circle back and finish, it's a field of knowledge that is very heavily dominated by actors from the global north. And we know that this is not just a question of justice, it has very concrete repercussions on the ground for the communities that feel these um, nested humanitarian crisis. So I'll stop there, but I'm very much looking forward to discussion. And again, congratulations on an open access journal. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. That was wonderful to hear to hear about that. And obviously our thoughts are, are all with the people of Afghanistan at the moment and everything they're going through. Um, so next speaker we have, um, we're delighted to have um, Agnes Kalabata, President of AGRA, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, and former Special Envoy of the UN Secretary General for the 2021 Food Systems Summit. And Agnes has written a brilliant piece in the, in the first collection on an African's perspective on food systems transformation. And she's joining us from um, a conference in Uganda right now. Thank you very much, Agnes. Uh, do we have Agnes? <laughs> yes, Dr. Agnes Karbata is really running around. She's within the Heads of State session at the moment at the Commonwealth Heads of State and Government. And she's struggling to get out to make sure that she beats the time here. But she's speaking just before the Heads of State as I speak now. Wow. And she okay. asked me to stand in and make some message just in case. And she, at some stage when she comes in, she will also participate in the question and answer session. But here is Agnes's message because they are well written in the piece and in the article. Uh, ideally, Agnes congratulates the entire leadership of this journal, especially coming through in terms of how you begin to see the challenges hitting the world. So congratulations to the team that is behind to make sure that this global social science journal is, is launched. And one of inspiration that Agnes is really happy about this particular launch is the characteristics of what is showing up in the global world. First of all, it started with climate change that has been consistent over a period of time, hitting our, not only our agriculture, but other uh, social issues, infrastructure and others, especially like the global warming that really resulted into desert locusts hitting most parts of Africa, disrupting some of the, most of the farming systems, then there came another social challenge, COVID-19, 
that most of you were able to see, shutting the entire economies of the world, disrupting the supply chains, and again, which uh, agriculture and food security were among the areas that affected uh, in most parts of the world. And then recent, the, the crisis and the challenge that is emerging from the conflict that's coming from the Russia and Ukraine. So Agnes Kalbata is extremely excited about this launch. Uh, and, and she's documented when the, 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 the journal reached out to her, they wanted her to document her experiences in what she saw during her leadership uh, of, the, uh, of the Food Security Summit. And, and Agnes asked a few questions. One of the key questions was, this is a, a, a global social science challenge journal. And any journal that is peer reviewed requires to have academically well written and, and referenced document. And for her yet, she was asked to document her own lessons. So it was actually a bit of a conflict, but later she was given a guidance to really put down her own experiences. And as you may recall, and this is part of the paper, the UN Secretary General appointed Dr. Kagnes Karibada as a special envoy uh, of the global system to really look at how the world was responding to the food systems challenge. And this was after realization that really almost many countries in the world were not on track to achieve the SDGs targets by 2030. And this became a very big concern for the, the Secretary General. And he really needed to look at a deep transformative shift that is affecting the global food systems. The main places that Agnes was looking at and the Secretary General was looking at was achieving zero hunger is becoming a nightmare and things need to be done differently. The shifting from consumption patterns towards health and sustainable diets was also getting in disarray. There was also concern about ensuring that environmental resources are not only protected, but they are also regenerated. And those were also affecting the global food systems. And then there was also needed to ensure that there is equity and shared values between producers, the society, the businesses, and the consumers uh, across the globe. So the Secretary General got concerned and raised this to a level where Agnes Karibata was appointed to lead the global community and also really established instruments and structures for her to be able to oversee this particular work. One of the most very strong ones was the scientific panel, a scientific group that did scientific documentation, bringing the evidence across the global divide to make sure that every options and choices that were being made were based on the real concrete science. The second most important piece that uh, was established after her appointment was to really to make sure that you have national-led, grassroots-driven country dialogues. The dialogue was the most fundamental piece. The intention of this was to make sure that most of the people that are often left behind when such kind of transformative changes are happening are also to have a voice on what exactly is failing the global system. What are the major concerns around these particular areas that are affecting the SDGs? And Agnes has really documented this very well. And one of the her very excitements, especially bringing the voice of the African community was that Africa was able to take a step forward with a clear continental vision through a common framework on food systems. That is called the Africa's common position. And this was very laudable given the fact that the time that was available to mobilize such a proportion was small, sparking all the fact that Africa is very clear on what it needs in the food system challenges. And also to making sure that the opportunities to fix them are outlined. And, and the excitement was also driven by the fact that heads of state stepped forward to document and bring from the what was emerging out of the of the country dialogues to be able to make very strong and actionable commitments. The other big success that Agnes has documented and she continued to reflect on this was that the Food Systems Summit was how was able to mobilize people out there to establish a certain sense of ambition and agents across the stakeholders and rather political will and inclusive stakeholders engagement to regain their and redesign the food systems in the manner that can actually effective, effectively respond and address some of the pressing challenges facing the food system today. Um, I really recall Agnes's key point here, and she says that one of the key steps and the priorities for the continent was the including and translating food systems pathways into strategies. She needed to make sure that 
It's not about dialogue. It's not about discussions because the whole global world has been actually putting in plans and strategies, but they were not embracing enough to cover the most ignored issues from a food systems perspective. The agriculture and uh, transformation issues were already laid out in continental mechanisms, but some of the elements that are critical to food systems were often ignored. So her concern was how to develop and operationalize food system investment plans at country level and how to enhance coordination mechanisms across different ministries because food systems spans beyond agriculture to infrastructure, to ministries of health. So coordinating those particular sectors to make sure that they come up with a very strong instrument that can be able to advance food systems was a very major action that needs to be picked from the experiences, but also moving forward. She's also thought through and she's engaging various stakeholders on the continent on how to develop accountability mechanisms aligned with the existing frameworks on the continent, such as the CADAP results framework, making sure that there is an instrument that brings together all key stakeholders, but because they are results and targets, you are able to track and create the necessary momentum to ensure that the food systems and transformation is not compromised. So in her ending remarks, she talks of the key things she needed to make sure that is happening. She's working with the Nepal Planning and Coordinating Agency and the entire African Union architecture to make sure that the critical steps are moving forward in the whole, on the whole continent. And she wants to apply the rest of some of this experience to the rest of the world. And, and some of the biggest principles and models is one to build and support a national capacity to develop and implement track national food systems pathways in ways that can bring coherence within the continent vision and the structures that have been established. She recognizes the value of the dialogues and engagement with various stakeholders, particularly those who are often neglected and hard to reach, especially the inclusion of best sectors like farmers, the youth, the women, the indigenous people, among others, all which are relevant to systems players that has to be involved. And she continues to call on these to be actively involved and engaged as implementation of the food systems pathways are happening. Lastly, uh, she's really mobilizing the continent and the global community to make sure that and encourage the conversations and debates around difficult topics. For example, today there are really a lot of topics around trade and you're seeing them emerging not only after COVID, but also under the uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis to reduce or not eliminate any export bans, especially in the areas of livestock, the fertilizer and the pesticide use, among others. All these issues are central in the food system transformation challenge and probably taking, make sure that there is a taking stock of what is happening to be able to achieve these continental desired outcomes. So Dr. Agnes Karibata looks forward to engaging with you here, but also making sure that in the future she continues to contribute through this journal to shape on the areas and ways on how the social challenges can be responded to because these challenges have come and they may not ever be able to stop. The prices are increasing. They may stabilize, but probably at a higher level, uh, incomes of individuals are remaining constant or even getting lower. So the challenges are going to be more than what we are seeing today. So she really uh, congratulates all of you for having this launched and uh, thank you for inviting her to speak at the launch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Boaz, and especially for stepping in at the last minute um, to represent Agnes. We understand that she has important work to do, and we hope that, that she might be able to join us um, briefly later on, if possible. Um, but that was fantastic to hear about the positive work that she's doing and also that she wants to carry on engaging with the journal. And I would say that um, you know, we welcome um, pieces from policy makers and practitioners, and we want the journal to be a true dialogue between research policy and practice, um, because that's what's important. So thank you very much, Buzz. Um, So next we have, um, all the way from Canada, Alison Mounts, who's Canada Research Chair in Global Migration at Wilfrid Laurier University. And she's going to be speaking about the paper on human migration in a new era of mobility, intersectional and transnational approaches. Thanks very much, Alison. Sorry, Alison, we, ca we can't hear you. You need to unmute. <laughs> Always happens at least once. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. No matter how long the pandemic goes on, there's always the person who forgets to unmute. Um, I wanted to start by saying congratulations to the whole team behind Global Social Challenges. It's very exciting to have a, a new journal, a new venue for those of us who do really interdisciplinary and international work. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you for including our writing for the opportunity to, to write something about global migration and displacement in the inaugural um, volume. The piece that you mentioned about global migration is co-authored with my wonderful colleague, Dr. Shiva Mohan, who's not speaking this morning, but who's on the call. Hello, Shiva. Um, Shiva opted to have me speak because it is currently 6 a.m. or so in his world in British Columbia. I want to say it's really significant and important, I think, that global migration has been included in the first issue given the importance of this issue in contemporary life. Um, it's an issue that really touches on every facet of our lives from in economic integration to cultural practices, issues of conflict, displacement, asylum seeking and refugee movements. And it's such an inherently interdisciplinary issue that always requires scholars to collaborate across international borders and also across the boundaries that divide disciplinary fields. Uh, so again, we welcome this, this venue um, as a place where I think work on migration will, will find a home. To quote a very often cited um, you know, uh, empirical reality in our fields, we're currently living in the highest, we're living the highest rates of global displacement since the architecture of global, global governments, governance was designed to really respond to displacement after World War II with the convention relating to the status of refugees. That's to say the global tools at our disposal are, are growing dated and often inadequate in the face of both the scope and also the complexity of the issue. And we write about this in our piece. Um, while there's rising scholarship, growing scholarship on global governance, these tools are really only as strong as the political will available amongst nation states, the primary units of analysis in migration research historically um, and in migration policy to actually address issues. And so at the same time, for example, that we see the highest rates of displacement, we also see that nation states are retreating from resettlement and devoting resources to these issues. Now, let me say that ours is a review article. So we endeavor to point to both the empirical scope of the issue and also its international breadth, the broad range of reasons why people migrate, uh, the structural barriers that they face uh, that render people more precarious. Because as we've seen during the pandemic, one of the main ways that states have responded to global migration and responded to the crisis that the pandemic presented was to, of course, fortify and shut down their borders. That was one of the very first things um, to have happened. And so the pandemic offered an opportunity where I think existing social realities were exposed and uh, intensified social divisions, polarization, and the fact that some people, uh, wealthier people always have more access to resources um, to move, mobility itself being a resource, while others are rendered uh, less mobile. So, um, you know, more often than not, people move out of need, out of desire, through any means they can. Therefore, there's a mismatch between the categories through which governments attempt to, quote unquote, manage migration and the actual ways and means by which people migrate. Um, this situation is, of course, heavily politicized in ways that grow more intense by the day with the rise in nationalism, racism, xenophobic forms of populism that cross borders and the intensification of material and structural barriers and borders to mobility. This is exacerbated by other issues that I know will be explored in this journal, like water scarcity, climate change, food insecurity, and even technological advances that make bordering um, more extensive and possible more rapidly. So we see a very kind of piecemeal um, set of policy and societal responses to migration and displacement and the fortification of immobilities and borders. Um, with the pandemic intensifying these extremes, what we advocate for in the piece is 
approaches that are both transnational and intersectional. And these are not new approaches. They originated in the 1980s and 90s, emerging out of, for example, critical race theory and black feminist scholarship um, in ways that really expose ju just how complex positionality is and how in the realm of migration, people's movement and social positionings will change over time and across space as their legal status changes, for example. Um, because this is a review piece, you could say it's citationally intense because there's so much great work out there. And one of the things we endeavor to do is to bring together these approaches that have been around for a while, just to say transnational and intersectional approaches, with more, more recent or newer literatures on mobility, migrant journeys, and border infrastructures, just to name a few examples. And I know um, my time is up, five minutes goes very fast. So I'll just close by saying that at the same time that the pandemic has um, given us uh, uh, you know, a time that is frightening, um, and some would argue very depressing um, in terms of what's happening for people on the move. There are also hopeful, hopeful things to look to, such as cross-border social movements, like movements to abolish detention um, that have gained momentum during the pandemic. And it's to this, these hopeful cross-border movements and different scales of analysis um, that we turn in, in our conclusions in the paper. So thank you for, for the opportunity to be part of the conversation. Thanks so much, Alison, and for keeping to time, which is very difficult on such a wide and important topic. Um, so I've seen that there are some questions coming in on the chat. Please do put them in the Q&A if you can, but my colleagues will pick them up and, and move them over there if not. Um, thank you very much. And last, but by no means least, we have Boaventura de Souza Santos, Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the University of Coimbra in Portugal, who's going to talk to us about his paper on the pandemic and the contradictions of contemporary... Yeah, I can't say that word. I'll let him say it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, both. Well, I don't have the image because the siren must be put me on the video, I think. Sarah? Um, that shouldn't happen. You should be able to switch that on yourself, Bella. He said, the, the Zoom says it's not possible to initiate your video because the, the host interrupted the video. So I, that's what I'm okay. receiving as a message. I'm sure, I'm sure Sarah will be trying to sort that. As we speak, let's let's try and um, make sure that we can see you because that would be um, the best thing if we can make that happen. Oh yeah, ah. finally, I think I'm there. There yeah. we go. <laughs> <laughs> thank Lovely. you. Ju. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's great pleasure to to be part of this conversation and of this project and open access journal is, is always the salute in our times. And I'm very glad to be here also because of the type of uh, topics that we are trying to uh, promote uh, in our conversation on a really global uh, egalitarian um, conversation. And for me, this is particularly important because I've been pleading for the epistemologies of the South, which is precisely the idea that uh, the, the, the knowledge is that have been born in struggles against oppression and domination, against capitalism, uh, against colonialism and against patriarchy. Uh, this knowledge have really in, in general have been discarded by our universities, by our journals. And uh, I can see that some of you that have been uh, speaking before are very much concerned as I am about these questions of uh, uh, cognitive justice. As, as I have been uh, writing, uh, there is no global social justice without global cognitive justice. I mean, justice among knowledges. And I hope that this uh, journal will be uh, uh, an effort to bring a little bit more of cognitive justice in our world, which is really not easy, but uh, I think that we should pursue this line. Well, in my, my paper, in fact, I'm uh, very much concerned when, when I wrote it. And in fact, it is a an embryo, the starting point for a book that will be published soon by Routledge, and the title is From the Pandemic to Utopia. The future begins now. 
So my idea was uh, that, in fact, this is the crisis that uh, marks the pandemic crisis, that marks the beginning of the of the millennium. Uh, and uh, I think it will, it's going to change our lives and our ways of living and being in the world. It is true that after that, I think we seem to be in a world that goes from crisis to crisis, and all of a sudden we have another crisis, uh, in this case, the in Europe, but uh, but uh, but uh, with repercussions all over the world, as, as we have already heard, and in fact, it is almost impossible uh, to think strategically when we are really always pressed by the crisis around us. And I think this is part of the domination of our system uh, and uh, the powers that dominate our world today. That is their purpose. They want us to be thinking from crisis to crisis without ever thinking about the real future, about what's, what's coming up in strategic terms. So I, I think that the, in this uh, paper, what I'm trying to address are the, the ways in which our contradictions in our world seem so obvious when a crisis emerges. And uh, at that point, when I was reading, uh, writing this was the, the pandemic crisis. Yeah, and it was true that, you know, it was on the eve of the artificial intelligence revolution, which shows uh, an immense hubris of humankind to dominate technologies. And all of a sudden we get uh, caught by a virus and even the most um, developed country in the world performs very poorly in defending the, people, the people's life from the, the virus. Uh, we have been uh, taught in the last uh, 40 years by hegemonic thinking that the markets and the private economy will solve our problems. Well, the pandemic came and people didn't look for the markets. In fact, the markets disappear. They look for the state to protect them, not to repress them, but to protect them. And in many cases, the state was not there because it has been underfunding the health systems and uh, was not prepared to uh, tackle this, uh, this issue. Uh, and finally, it was a global pandemic, but uh, uh, as everything in globalization in our time, in our times, shows inequalities and strengthens the inequalities. So my work is about uh, the discriminatory nature of this pandemic, because see, I'm speaking in a country in which most people or many people have three doses of vaccines and uh, myself four doses. And I think that is unjust in, in structural terms. Uh, because many people in Africa and Latin America don't even have one dose of this uh, of this virus. I think that uh, uh, unless the world is, uh, all the world is protected, nobody will be ever really protected. And, and we know that, and we know that. So I think that my paper is a comment on this virus uh, and uh, really try to have a conversation with it. Uh, it's not an enemy, it's, a, it's a, probably a pedagogue. And in my paper, what I'm trying to show is that uh, how can this virus shows us some lines of the future. That's basically the, the crush uh, of, the, the, of the paper. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Boa. And I do urge you all to read um, the papers that are being discussed today and, and the other ones in the issue. Um, that was really interesting to hear, albeit briefly, um, about some of them there. So I'm going to invite people to put their um, cameras back on, um, the speakers today, and we'll have a look at some of the questions. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay, so we have, I'm gonna take um, one that came in early on for Alison. And this question is from Darina Gossu. Thank you, Darina. And it says, Alison, aren't the leaders the main people who are responsible for cre creating the large scale migration? What is considered as a large scale migration? And is there a calculation available? Okay, thanks, Doreena, for your question. Um, yes, I agree. <laughs> Political leadership plays an important role in responding or not responding, or responding in particular ways. Um, and, and I spoke briefly uh, in my remarks about the um, ways that the global governance architecture is not able, for example, to 
adequately address either the issue of displacement or the responses of particular nation states to um, migration and displacement. But of course, um, I'd say there's also this historical divide in research on migration between um, structure and agency. And um, the exciting bit is everything that happens in between. And so in the work, we try to lay foundations and also look at the work that has done that for understanding both structural issues um, that cause uh, or intensify displacement and also um, the ways that people of all kinds and all sorts of social positionings um, are responding. So I, I appreciate your remark and I, I don't disagree. Um, I think the question is what kinds of approaches enable us to, to most fully understand the issue. As for the um, your question about how do we calculate what is large scale migration? I like that question because I think it gets at the, the politics and politicization of discourse about migration, which is always tied to, or very often tied, I should say, to crisis narratives, right? Which render um, numbers relative. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. So um, the current figure for the uh, number of people who are displaced globally is 89.3 million people, according to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. That includes people displaced across an international border and internally. Probably we can all agree that that figure represents large scale migration. The current figure for people displaced from the Ukraine is over 5 million, again, over an international border, um, but closer to 13 million, if you include people who are also in, uh, displaced internally. Again, we're reading the news and looking at what's happened, the tragedies unfolding, we can all probably agree that that is a large scale migration. Um, but here in Canada, we have a much smaller, we have a very small population compared, for example, to other countries that are addressing um, displacement, resettlement, uh, asylum seeking, but very small numbers of arrivals um, can be perceived and presented in Canadian and international media as large scale and are certainly large scale in terms of the societal and policy responses to them. So just to give two examples, in um, 2017, after Donald, the, sorry, the Donald Trump administration came into power, um, about 50,000 people crossed the, the, the border, the land border between Canada and the United States and made us claims for asylum um, because of various things that were happening in the US related to the Trump administration, such as the intensification of enforcement, detention, deportation. We could probably not agree that 50,000 is a large scale migration, and yet it was narrated and presented as, as such and an enormous crisis um, in terms of policy and enforcement response and societal response in Canadian society at the time. One other example, and I'll stop talking, was an even smaller number. Um, this is the topic of my first book, Seeking Asylum which was um, when boats were intercepted uh, carrying people from China off the coast of British Columbia in 1999 and 2000, about 600 people in total, a very small number, we could probably agree in the grand scheme of things, um, people made asylum claims and were um, held in detention. And this was again, a, a crisis in Canada, one that influenced changes, significant changes in refugee and immigration policy. So I think the, it's a long-winded way of saying um, there is no agreed upon number for large scale migration, um, but, but there is an agreement that what is significant is the scale of narrative and, and response. And that's why it's so important to look at both the migration itself, to place it in context, and also understand um, policy responses in context. Thanks. Thank you, Alison. That was a really comprehensive answer. And yeah, I, I think we've experienced that sort of subjectivity a lot in the UK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've got a question from Hilary Graham for Adriana. Um, she says, you noted in your presentation that climate related negotiations tend to be at high level, global or national. Could you say a little more about whether it's possible to move climate action, e.g. around the Paris Agreement, the UNFCCC, global stop take, um, to, and how lived experience and local knowledge to open up national and global policy um, to, local, yeah, to local knowledge and public stakeholders? But basically, how do we involve um, people at local level much more. Uh, thank you, uh, Julia. Thank you, Hilary. That's a great question. And we 
we talk a lot about this at, at our think tank. So when it comes to the Paris Agreement and, and the conventions, um, you know, and having been to uh, conferences of the parties, the, the conversation is still very much focused on mitigation and mitigation is very important, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's mostly about these abstract numeric goals um, and energy transition and, and then other aspects of climate action, especially adaptation, losses and damages, climate financing, they get secondary, I would say tertiary status. And these are conversations that are very strategic for thinking at the local level, because any kind of adaptation has to address the local experiences, losses and damages, of course, is about climate justice at the local level, especially, and climate, without climate financing, it's impossible to scale up um, any solutions. So it's really a political set of barriers primarily, and that's how we see it very much expressed, even in the physical configuration of COPs, where you have the blue and the green zone, and the formal negotiations that focus on migration tend to uh, interact very little with a very vibrant and much more local uh, focused um, interventions by civil society. Second, we need more um, credible and meaningful channels for effective participation uh, by civil society, especially indigenous and other population groups that are um, disproportionately exposed to both climate change and in, in this case uh, to conflict. And, um, you know, again, we're taking the COP as an example that's not yet in place. There are some advances in civil society participation, but they, um, uh, they tend to benefit groups in the global north. You know, they have the usual suspects organizations and they do excellent work. They get resources, they get credentials. Whereas um, those groups in the global south that need to be there um, have very little access. And by the way, I'm a bit concerned about the Egypt COP that's coming up because it seems that even fewer credentials will be made available. And what happens is that we in the global south end up having to compete among each other um, for what, whatever foothold we can get in those spaces. So it's, it's again, I'm using this as an example of how unjust the system is set up to not address climate justice and especially climate racism. Um, and then finally, um, Plataforma CIPO, our think tank is working with GPAC, the Global Pact for the Prevention of Armed Conflict on a guidance note for communities to carry out climate sensitive risk assessment. And even though it's a methodology that it's right now being tested in Uganda and um, Zimbabwe with the input of um, local leaders from elsewhere. Uh, we hope that this will generate lessons learned that can then be uh, taken up by policymakers. But there, there's a lot of resistance for policymakers, whether at the nas national level or at the United Nations, to really sit down and listen. So there's this capacity building to be done at the front end of that chain, but there's also awareness raising um, to be made among policymakers of the importance of incorporating those local experiences. Thank you. That's very interesting, Adriana. Yeah, <laughs> something to bear in mind. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, we are going to try and wrap up at, at three if we can. So we won't be able to go into this in, in as much detail as we probably like. Um, but we've got a question for um, Boa, Professor Santos. Most states in the global south are fashioned through colonial imposition and continue to serve neo-colonial interests. Whilst fighting neoliberalism is discrediting of the role of the state, how can we also transform the, the colonial structures and institutions of states to make them key actors in the fight for social and cognitive justice? And that's from Eo Balka Gebrimari. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm sure I pronounced your name. Thank you. Well, Thank it's, you. It's, it's a very important question. It's a very good question. Uh, in fact, the state is part of the problem as much as it is part of the solution. That's the problem that we face today. And basically, we have to work. I mean, the progressive groups that are anti, really anti-capitalist, anti-colonialist, and anti-patriarchal, they have to struggle both inside the state and outside the state and to try to develop new agendas. For instance, sometimes to work in the state, within the state, 
means constitutional reforms. For instance, we have had in the past, uh, in recent past, in Latin America, some interesting processes of transforming the national states into plurinational states, between Ecuador, in Bolivia, and now in Chile, for instance. They are very uh, interesting experiences, even if they, they fail, they go in the, in the right direction, in my view. The other one is that we have to develop their own agendas and not link them to the agendas of the global NGOs. The NGOs are part of our problem, quite frankly, not part of the solution. For instance, they have been telling us about food security. Please, this is not the agenda for the peasants around the world. This food sovereignty is something else. I mean, the Via Campesina of the, the, the landless peasants around the world have been pleading for food sovereignty. And now after the crisis, it's very clear that what we need is food sovereignty. And in the future, because we are going through a period of deglobalization with probably two systems, parallel systems, I think that people that are in between, and I think in African countries, they are now discussing very closely this. Uh, I think it's impossible to, to, to discuss uh, food sovereignty. And the peasants at the, at the center, the peasants have never been at the center because they are not at the center in, in, in Europe and in the global north, but they should be really, uh, if you want to develop new lines of uh, ecologies, for instance, fighting against colonial energetic or uh, energetic colonialism as we have been fighting in Mexico recent and uh, to allow for the, the transition to energetic transition in Europe at the cost of the indigenous people in Latin America. I mean, that's the world as it is now. I think that probably, uh, Job, if you are at university, the task is decolonizing the universities. I mean, we have really, uh, both in Africa, Latin America, Europe, and the North, we have been teaching the knowledge of the winners of history. We have never taught the knowledge of the losers of history. I think we have to start doing that. The tasks are different in the global North, in the global South. I've been working with students at Oxford and Cambridge, at Glasgow and Bristol, in fact, that have been uh, um, dealing with this problem. And I think we should pursue both in the global north and the global south. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Boa. And actually, um, yes, totally agree. And there's a really interesting paper in this first issue um, from Gaminda Brambra about um, a call for reparatory social science um, and to look at look at that very issue. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you um, to everybody that's joined us today and for the questions. Um, and especially a big thank you to hopefully we've got more of our wonderful team of editors, associate editors and advisory board members on the call. Thanks so much to you for your work. And a huge thank you to Sarah Bird, who is the managing editor of the journal and has played a pivotal role in its development behind the scenes. Um, Sarah, perhaps you could put your camera on so everybody can see you. So if you are interested in submitting a paper to the journal, um, you will have some contact with Sarah and she'll be able to help you with any questions that you've got. Um, I don't know if you wanted to say something quickly, Sarah, about that. I think I just want to say that there's a wonderful community gathering and growing around this journal so please do come and join us to write or to read and um anytime that you want to get in touch with me my email is info at globalsocialchallenges.com but you'll also find us you'll find my details on the website and thanks all so much for coming in to all of the speakers wonderful and this is just the start so we want we hope you will all be um, a part of it and join us and this hopeful endeavor in a in a rather hopeless world at times but this is very positive um, initiative and project so thank you very much to everybody again